receive a lot of rest. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a neurologic condition where you get a slow, progressive loss of function in athletes with a history of multiple concussions. This is becoming an issue with our professional athletes now. <coughs> Other names for concussion that players use, a bell ring or a ding, a mild traumatic brain injury, uh, lots of other uh, euphemisms, but in the, the bottom line is the last three words, it is a traumatic brain injury that is occurring. Now, in your sports, uh, we know that about 12% of traumatic brain injuries among recreational sports are from horseback riding or horse-related incidents, which is the highest percentage of recreational sports. And in 2009, over 14,000 ER visits for significant brain injuries among riders. Um, athletic brain injury as a whole is an enormous public health problem, between 2 and 4 million annually just in the U.S., and people can be affected just for minutes, days, weeks, even months or years. About 15% of patients who have one of these sports-related injuries will have symptoms one year after the injury. So this is a very significant uh, proportion of affected individuals. And we know that an athlete or a participant who sustains a concussion four to six times more likely to have a second concussion. Some research shows that concussions are on the rise, and, um, and I think this is because nowadays athletes at all levels are bigger, faster, stronger, they weight train, they start earlier, and so the impact and the speed of collisions are greater now than they were in times gone by. About 10% of all high school athletic injuries are brain injuries, and over 135,000 ED visits a year for sports-related concussions. So this is an enormous public health problem. In the U.S., we think about it in football, and certainly football is our poster child for athletic brain injury. 300,000 concussions per year in the U.S. Uh, among Division I college football players, at least a third have had one concussion, which I think is probably low, it's self-reported. 20% though of all high school football players have a concussion each season. And now, the group that I'm seeing the biggest rise in are soccer players. It's the high school soccer athletes that I see a, a huge number of. And again, I think these numbers are probably underreported. Unfortunately, still a number of deaths, even in sports you wouldn't think of, about eight deaths per year from football in the U.S., and more deaths from brain injury than any other sports-related injury across the board, football and other sports included. If you look, though, many times people think, well, it's just a football problem, but it's not. If you look at this list, which comes from the athletic training literature, you can see sports you might not think of, like wrestling, lacrosse, softball, there's still a fairly significant instance of head injury. We don't have equestrian sports on this because they're obviously not as common in high schools, but I think they certainly would join this list. And as I said, we're seeing, for example, soccer and girls and boys have an incidence per participant that's almost out of football. So let's talk for a second about uh, mechanisms of injury now. And how do people actually get hurt and what's involved with that? Uh, well, the skull is our, our obvious uh, first protective layer uh, with the brain. And you can see that the skull has um, uh, varying thickness in various regions of the brain. It has a lot of venous channels in it, and there are large veins that go between the surface of the brain and the skull. And so these have the potential for tearing. And, and the skull is there for protection, but obviously it's not infallible. And you can see in instances like this where the skull is buckled, there's a large subcutaneous hematoma, and then a skull fracture that's associated with this. One thing that's key is that you can't reliably diagnose a skull fracture by feeling the head. Uh, because there's a lot of individual variability in the baseline contours of the skull, such for this patient. And, and you don't always have to have a scalp laceration to have a skull fracture. Your skin may be fully intact and your skull can still be fractured. So if you suspect this, we always send folks in for a CT. And a skull fracture can occur even with a relatively mild brain injury. A vascular skull fracture is probably more common, particularly in equestrian athletes. Uh, here they can present in a delayed fashion. Uh, they may have hearing loss, disequilibrium, problems with leak of spinal fluid, and this is a very common symptom, loss of smell or taste. It has to do with the shearing of the small nerves at the base of the brain. A couple of signs to look for are the so-called raccoon's eyes or the battle sign. So here's the raccoon's eyes. Uh, this guy is not in boxing, but that's actually uh, blood that's collected around the eyes as a result of a basilar skull fracture. And then the battle sign is uh, bruising behind the ear on the mastoid bone. It's another sign of a fracture of the skull with a very slight clinical sign that you have to sort of know what to look for. Uh, unfortunately, we do still see some brain uh, hematomas where uh, blood collects on the surface of the brain, uh, usually with severe headache or vomiting, lethargy, sometimes the pupils will be asymmet uh, asymm uh, asymmetric. And this is notorious for having a so-called lucid interval, which is uh, the case of this unfortunate actress, you may remember, where someone has an injury, seems okay for a period of hours, and then deteriorates very quickly and dies uh, as a result of the pressure building up in 
inside the brain. So again, these are uh, problems that while they're not common, we certainly see it's important to be aware and, and to diagnose quickly. We have to always remember for an unconscious patient that they may have a spine injury as well. And again, another major course, uh, cause of morbidity and mortality in these athletes. And we have to take appropriate precautions on the scene at the site of the incident to stabilize these athletes. So let's talk just a minute now more specifically about concussion, the, the milder forms of traumatic brain injury, and how does this happen? You're going to hear some speakers who are much more educated than I am about some of these mechanisms, but suffice it to say that it's not always the direct blow. In fact, it's probably more frequently this rotational uh, vector of energy that causes these concussions. And uh, that's happening at a macroscopic level. At a microscopic level, there's a whole cascade of events going on with the cells in the brain that results in a lot of alterations in brain chemistry that leads to a final common pathway of cell death. And you don't have to be a physician to know that death of your brain cells is not a good thing. Um, these are the diagrams that drive medical students crazy because we memorize them and get tested on them and promptly forget them. But this, the point of the slide is there are a lot of alterations going on in the cells in the brain where chemicals and ions are moving in different gradients. And these things get affected in profound ways by brain injury. And these effects last, as you heard, many times weeks, months, or even years. And this is what's producing the symptoms. So it's not quite as simple as blow comes into the head, the head gets, the brain gets deformed and gets bruised. It's actually a whole biochemical cascade of events that, uh, that's going on in these injuries. We do know that there are regional vulnerabilities. Not every part of your brain is as susceptible. It's not just that some people are hard-headed, like my wife accuses me of sometimes. It's that your brain really has different regions that are susceptible to injury. And you can see that the function of some of these areas, like memory retrieval, emotional learning and conditioning, are the things that we see affected after concussion. So as these areas of the brain are more vulnerable and become injured, these are the deficits that we then begin to see in athletes who sustain injury. We have a problem of studying this because we don't have great animal models. Uh, sure, we can take a rat and strap a little helmet on them and make a, a collision in the lab. And in fact, some folks would help them uh, have to do that for a living. But the problem is these are not really real-world models because the animals are usually anesthetized. There's a, there's a very directed force that uh, loses a lot of this rotational component. The smaller brains that they have seem to tolerate acceleration and deceleration forces differently than humans and they're using loss of consciousness sometimes as a marker. So the point is we don't have great basic science studies because we just don't have a lot of good animal models for that. So we're sort of relegated to studying this uh, in the clinical panel and we have to look at, at what we see clinically. And how do we diagnose this? Well, unfortunately, concussion or brain injury is mostly a clinical diagnosis that relies on the reported symptoms, observation of the athlete, their behavior function, and exam of specific brain function. There's an inherent problem about truthful reporting, something we'll come back to and talk about in a minute. But you have to have somebody on site who's trained and understands what to look for and to assess these injuries so that a brain injury can be identified. Signs and symptoms of concussion are probably familiar to most of you. Signs are things uh, that uh, we observe. Symptoms are things that the patient reports to us. So the patient will frequently complain of headache, the most common symptom. Nausea, balance problems, vision problems, feeling sluggish or foggy, trouble concentrating, problems in sleep. And again, these symptoms sometimes appear weeks uh, after the, uh, the event. Uh, I saw an athlete just uh, a day or two ago, a varsity basketball player, Vanderbilt, and she had been injured and uh, thought she was recovering and went back about three weeks later and thought, well, I'm just out of shape because as I go back and start playing, I'm really getting fatigued. Then they put in some new plays, and she couldn't remember the plays that they were running. And she was playing in the games, but she couldn't remember any of these plays. A very bright student. Um, and she ended up failing most of her final exams at the end of the semester because she still had the delayed effects from her brain injury three weeks before. So these things don't always show up right away. Signs of things that we observe, as I said, the athlete's dazed, they're confused, they don't know where they are, they're moving slowly, they're clumsy, they're just not performing at their level. The most common symptoms, headaches, dizziness, and visual problems. Those are the things that in large studies have been shown. Only about 10% who have a significant brain injury will lose consciousness. So again, not necessary to have a loss of consciousness. A lot of grading scales are out there. You may have heard or read about these. And uh, as physicians, uh, we love to grade things. Grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. You know, gives us some endpoints to look at. 
the point in, in concussion is this is not a good thing. We don't really have good definitions. There's no correlation with the outcome, and, and it really doesn't have anything to do with return to play. And so we're getting away from this. Years and years, trainers said, okay, you had a grade two concussion, you have to be out of your sport for two weeks. And of course, that was totally arbitrary. It was not based on any science. And nowadays, we're, we're getting away from this model and, and trying to be a little more thoughtful. Now, we assess each concussion based on when it happened, how long the symptoms lasted, how old is the athlete, because we know that younger athletes take a lot longer to recover. We know that female athletes take longer to recover. So their variance is there we need to account for. And most importantly, the player's previous concussion history. We need to know what they've had in the past. So most of our diagnosis is by clinical. It's what we see, what the athlete tells us, the history that we gather. That's why I'm trained professionals are important. And imaging doesn't really help us a lot because most of the time, CAT scans or MRIs will be normal. But this does not rule out that a very serious brain injury has occurred because these tests, CAT scan and MRIs, show structure. They don't show function. So I always tell athletes, it's like flying over a neighborhood in a, in a plane. You can look down and you can see the houses. The houses may all look okay. You have no idea that there's a fire going on in the kitchen in someone's house and there's about to be a disaster. Just because the CT and MRI looks normal doesn't tell us what's happening functionally there. So one of the big advances we've seen is in the idea of computerized neurocognitive testing. And what is this? Well, basically a concussion produces alterations in brain functions that we can measure. Things like visual attention, concentration, visual, verbal, and spatial memory and reaction time. These are things we can measure. And in the past, to measure this, you had to go get with a neuropsychologist and take a, a pen and a paper test. And that wasn't easy because there aren't a lot of neuropsychologists running around to do this. It took three or four hours and it cost a truckload of money. So that really wasn't very useful on a, on a broad scale basis. <laughs> These computerized tests have now been developed. They can measure these functions in 15 or 20 minutes. They can be taken anywhere, literally anywhere in the world that you have access to a computer. You can take this test, and it gives us an objective measure of performance, which gets away from us having to ask the athlete, how are you doing? Because as you quickly learn when you deal with athletes, particularly at the higher levels, they know how to answer the questions, right? If they tell you they've got a headache, or they're feeling dizzy, or they're feeling foggy, or they're not going to get to play, they quickly lie about that. So this gives us that objective measure to see, has the brain really recovered? And there's several commercial products available. The one that I'm most familiar with and we've used is the so-called impact test. It's developed at the University of Pittsburgh Sports Concussion Center. It's a, about a 20-minute online test that takes a demographic uh, history. It gets a scale of symptoms, and then it measures eight different neurocognitive domains that you can read there, and then it generates a report. For the athlete, they think they're playing a video game. Okay, they're sitting down there clicking there, they're uh, engaging in these different modules, and so it's, it's a very easy test for them to take, and as I said, it can be done anywhere with our pro sports teams, for example, they stick it on a laptop and they can be traveling anywhere, take the test, and then they can email it to me to be evaluated. So the way this works is we like to get a baseline test on the athlete before the season so that we know what their performance is. It's not a graded test where you make an A, B, C, D, or F, you know, it's just, it's your performance. It's like your 40-yard dash time. How fast can you run that 40-yard dash? And then the idea is if the athlete has...